live. Welcome, everyone. It's so good to be back um, with you for the COVID-313 Coalition for Families and Students Town Hall. Um, good to be back for another Thursday. I'm Christine Bell. I'm the Executive Director of Urban Neighborhood Initiative, a really proud member of this coalition and a mom of three wonderful children that you may hear in the background. Um, so I apologize for any background noise. Um, we want to give folks time uh, to get comfortable and get on the right line before we get started. We've got a great town hall for you today. We're really excited. So Ophelia, can you please share the details for how to listen to Spanish interpretation. Yes, thank you, uh, Christine. Si ocupas el traducción en español, por favor, busca en, en el chat o ve la página de Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation para ver la traducción en vivo de este video. Otra vez lo vamos a poner el, en el chat y también pueden ir a nuestro Facebook y la traducción sería hecha por la señora Doña Gloria Rosas y Cristina Ruiz Manza. Thank you so much, Ophelia, and thank you, Gloria and Christina, for um, providing the interpretation services. We are very much appreciative. And um, could uh, Katie, could you please share uh, the instructions for ASL? Thank you so much, Katie, and it is great to have you with us um, again today mm -hmm. and kicking us off. Um, and, you know, as always, uh, this is not just us bringing information to you, but we really want to hear from you. We want to know what questions you have so that I can ask them. Um, and we also want to hear your comments. And you can ask your questions or comment by using the Facebook chat. Lindsay and uh, Lindsay and Rita, I think, are with us today monitoring the chat. And you can test uh, test them right now. Make sure that they're they're uh, on their on their uh, game by sharing with us how you heard about the town hall today, and um, and maybe what do you want to hear about in the future. Um, and then you can also text your questions to our, our, text, uh, our text number at 313. Um, thank you, Molly, for sharing your screen because I you would think after a year I would have this number memorized, but I do not. Um, so you can, you can text your numbers to 313. Molly, can you change the screen so that the, the text message line we can took, come we up? We took away the text message line. We're just doing messages in the chat. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. So I apparently cannot text those questions today. So please put all your, your questions and comments in the chat. Um, all right. And I am going to now pass this on to Rajeshri. Rajeshri, let's hear from you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rajeshri Bhatia, and I am the Director for School Performance for Grand Valley State University's Charter School Office. Uh, I am also a former teacher, school principal, and mother of two beautiful girls. Um, some of you may know that this week is uh, National Teacher Appreciation Week. Or, and, and technically I think it's actually the month, but uh, which is what we should celebrate. And so we wanted to take a moment to um, ask you all to take, to think back to a teacher who has influenced your life, who you really enjoyed being around, who made a difference to you. And we wanna also uh, recognize that teachers have made this pandemic period in particular, much more bearable for our children, and we want to appreciate them. And as we think back to those teachers that, uh, that influence us, I'm, I'm lucky to have several of them. 
Um, but one in particular that I'll talk about today is in this picture with me, and that's my very first dance teacher. Um, Mrs. Bursa taught me how to do basic tap and ballet at a time when I didn't really think I knew or could ever do that. And that's what great teachers do. They inspire. They teach us to believe in ourselves. They help us accomplish something that we never thought we'd accomplished before. They have fun doing it. They're role models. I loved seeing Mrs. Bursa because she was so graceful when she moved and she always had the coolest earrings and the coolest jewelry. And I just wanted to be just like her. And, you know, I, like I said, I'm lucky to have several teachers in my memory bank. I'm sure each of you is fondly remembering uh, at least one of your own and your own children's teachers as well. Um, but this month, we really want to take time as a coalition to recognize teachers. And so to that end, we invite you to submit a nomination of a teacher um, who's influenced your child's life. And we will be recognizing them at a future town hall. And also every teacher will receive a small gift from this coalition. So I'm gonna ask one of my colleagues to please drop the nomination form in the chat. And we really hope that you'll take this opportunity to help recognize and honor these individuals who have given so much of themselves and who continue to do so who shape our next generation and who really help make the world a better place. So with that, I'll hand it back to, um, hand it back to Christine and I'll see you guys in a little bit. Thank you. Rajeshi, that was so beautiful. Um, and you just made me think about, um, I literally would not have been able to get through high school without Mr. Ogden and Mr. Biglin. Mr. Biglin was, um, my swim coach and, uh, and a science teacher. And Mr. Ogden was um, my ninth grade English teacher. And I truly, for all four years, used to go back into his room whenever I was having a really bad day. And he encouraged me to keep on. So I just, um, please, right now in the chat, grab that form, nominate a teacher. You don't have to be in school right now. You can nominate someone that meant uh, a lot to you when you were in school. Um, but teachers really, really do transform young people's lives um, and in really positive ways. So um, make sure you do that. And we'll, we'll know that the chat is working if you go ahead and do that. Again, we're translating the town hall to Spanish um, and uh, ASL. So um, if Ophelia, if you would come back on one more time and share the information on how to connect to the Spanish interpretation. Yes, thank you. Si ocupas traducción o quieres ver este video en español, por favor ve a la página de Facebook de Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation, donde están haciendo la interpretación en vivo. Y también en el chat, ahí van a estar el enlace para ver el video. Uh, la traducción hoy sería hecha por la señora Cristina Riz Manzón y la señora Gloria Rosa. Thank you so much, Ophelia. And then Katie, could you please share the instructions for ASL one more time? Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and again, you can put your, your comments and questions in the Facebook chat. And we've got Lindsay um, and Rita, I believe, monitoring the chat for us today. And so they're waiting for your questions. Um, we'd like to remind you to stay with us for the next 60 minutes. Um, so you can stay informed and be empowered. We have a collection of experts to share their expertise in a number of different areas and answer the question that, the common question that, that you've been asking or that you've heard your friends ask. So um, they're here, they're, they know and ready to answer your questions. Um, so we're gonna have a question and answer after each segment. Um, if we can't answer your question today, we're committed to getting the answer to you by early next week. And all of the questions asked today will be posted with their answers 
on one Detroit PBS.org so that you can go back and reference them later. For our experts, please remember to speak slowly for our translators. They really want to make sure that they're translating the important information that you're sharing correctly. Also, turn off your cameras when you're not speaking to ensure that our ASL interpreter can be seen. And please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Terry Whitfield, the most amazing timekeeper of timekeepers, is with us today. And he will chat you your remaining time. Uh, so keep your eye on the chat. If you go over your time, uh, uh, myself, uh, Jametta, or Rajeshree will come onto the, to the screen and gently remind you to wrap up. Um, we've got so many uh, great guests today that we want to make sure that we give each of you um, a good amount of time to share your information and then, of course, have the audience ask questions. And so it is with my great pleasure that I get to hand uh, this over now to uh, Jametta Lilly. Jametta? Thanks so much, Christine. And it's a joy to follow up from Rajeshree, who wonderfully showed a picture of her when she was just a little blooming flower in the hands of a teacher. Uh, so my name is Jametta Lilly, and I am just so blessed to serve as the CEO of the Detroit Parent Network. And so I would like for us to think about something as we are all embracing uh, teacher appreciation. And that's to remember that our parents are our very first teacher. And truly they are our most enduring teacher for many of us throughout our lifetime. But I would just love to say, I would like to lift up all the wonderful teachers from Thurco Elementary School, but also as a point of quick history that just occurred to me, I happen to have been one of the first five students to quote, integrate uh, what used to be Winship Junior High. And so all of those teachers were very remarkable to make sure that all of us little raisins in the batch of all of that oatmeal at Winship Junior High felt comfortable. And it was my gym teacher, Mrs. Krause, who was exceptional. Not only did she help create intramural back basketball, of which I was on the team, she battled the suburban middle schools who refused to let us play because half the team by that time were all little black girls. So we were affirming our black girl magic that back then and Mrs. Cross was an ally and helped to support that. And she is still here. So I wanna lift up her name as well. And so with that, we wanna encourage all of you to do the same. Go back in your memory. <clears throat> Remember that teacher or those teachers that made a difference in your life. Let's lift up their names. Teaching is a magnificent occupation and we so need it now. The heart of teaching. But something else is really important as we think about heart and that's the people who have the heart to do community organizing. And so I'm really pleased that on the program, I have the opportunity to introduce a community organizer, uh, Oscar Castaneda, who is with the Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation and working on something that is just so critical and that's redistricting. De redistricting in the context of a state and indeed a nation that has been victimized by gerrymandering. But I'm sure Oscar, you're going to talk about that. So welcome to COVID-313. It's a delight to have you on board. <laughs> Audience, we're going to hear from Oscar for a little bit, and then we're going to open it up to questions. Welcome, Oscar. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having, for having me in your space. Um, I'm going to try to go through this presentation in 10 minutes, and hopefully I succeed. Uh, I have some PowerPoint material that I want to show you. I don't know who has it. I th I thought it was Molly who had I'm my PowerPoint. It. I'm pulling it up right now, Oscar. Okay, 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 okay. okay. So yeah, I was gonna say, go ahead. She's I, got I, you. I want to start. I'm gonna start by saying my, my name is Oscar Castañeda. I am a community organizer, as it was said before. I work with Ophelia. And Ophelia has been part of this of this space for a long time, for a longer time than me as well, at least. So if you ever want to get a hold of me, 
And hopefully my goal today with this 10 minutes is to get you excited about this and to make you think that you have to take action. So if I achieve that and you don't know how to find me, please reach out to Ophelia. Ophelia knows how to find me. I talk to Ophelia every single day. So this is me and this is my organization. Uh, and this is my email address. Um, and the topic for today is redistricting Michigan. And you know, I, I've done this presentation in Spanish several times. And the first time I found something really interesting for the translation that I don't know how to say redistricting in Spanish. That's not the exact word. So it's probably recreation of the uh, recreation de distritos, or probably rediseño de distritos, but it's not an, an exact translation. So we Spanish speakers need to somehow uh, grasp the meaning and probably forget about the translation. So next slide, please. So we all know, and this is in this space, I don't need to preach about this, how the Southwest, the Tory Latino community and all minorities have been always loving vote. And the, and the Latino population in particular is the one of the lowest. And in some, some political analysts speak about the Southwest Detroit as a dead zone because of the low voting. Next, please. I'm showing here a few numbers. Uh, the blue line shows a... Uh, white, non-Hispanic voters, the green shows African-American, and the orange and red lines at, at the bottom are Asian and Hispanic. So see, Hispanic does really badly. Uh, we had some level of excitement in 2008, which means the Obama, the Obama election, and that's about it. But we are really low constantly. And then the question is, next please, why? Why is that we we don't turn out to vote? And some people will say, I, I don't understand the process. I don't know what voting is. And and you know, people who is you expect to be informed, I find when you ask them who's your, your state rep, they don't know. Or oh, who is your, your US Congress representative, they don't know. And not to be blamed for, because the system is complex, it's not simple. Another good reason that is probably related to this, next please, is I don't speak English, and that doesn't apply only to Latinos, that applies to many minorities. And we at the HDC are working in this project of trying to have more information translated. But a lot of research is finding that the main reason for people to not to get interested in voting is, next please, is because people, people think that nobody really represents me or represents you. And that becomes a major problem. So <laughs> I noticed in this presentation that I'm probably one of the one of the very few men in here. So I thought that this graphic was great. We really, we really need to make sure that our vote counts and to make sure that mi voto cuenta and that our opinion is going to be heard. Why is that so far we constantly feel like we are not being, we, we being here? Next, please. One important reason is that until now, in Michigan and in many states of the United States, the decisions were made. So there is a census. After the census, they use the census numbers to reallocate the districts, to shape the districts. And it's, it, it used to be made by the power, by the party that was in power the year of the election. In Michigan, for the composition of the state and bad luck and other circumstances, the last 40 years, it has been done by Republicans. And that has an effect. And next, please. I always show this small exercise and I wish I could spend more time in this today, but I won't. But again, this, this PowerPoint can be available for you if you want it. And this is not even my graphic. I took it from someone else. In this, in this box, in the left, you see 50 small squares. Out of those 50 small squares, uh, uh, 20 are red and 30 are blue. So it's close, it's not that very different. But then when you look at the box in the center and the box in the right hand side, you can see how different <coughs> the outcome can be depending on how you break that big box. So uh, in the square, in the in the center, you can see that it was broken fairly equal. It's proportional. It makes sense according with the whole content of the whole box. 
In the right hand side, you can see that depending on how you divide the space, you always will get a different outcome. And this is what gerrymandering is about. Um, so the results, look at this funny shape. W what is this about? Doesn't have nothing to do with a box, right? There's another one. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Those funny shapes. And to make it more personal, next, please. I want to talk about Detroit and Southwest Detroit. So this picture that you're looking at, the dark is the Latino population. The darker, the more Latinos are. Uh, gray means some Latinos. So please get a mental picture of this graphic. Look at the Latinos in Michigan. Next. These are the districts, the way they are today in Detroit. So, and again, look at the funny shapes. And you have to think, why do they come up with these funny shapes? What is the rational? Look by where it says Farmington Hills. Why do you want to have this thing, uh, this thing like picking out, like looks like a camera sitting in a table? Next. <laughs> now, look at what they did. The red line is outlining the spaces where you saw dark for the Latino population in the first picture. And watch, they divided the Latino population in, into three different districts. So we will never have power with this. So there, is, there are some Latinos left in the green space, in the light green. There are some other Latinos left in the other green and some Latinos in the orange. We will never be together that way. This is exactly what gerrymandering is about. So if we were all in the same district, things would be different. They would listen to us at least more than what they do now. This is exactly the gerrymandering problem. Next, please. And this is what we're trying to fix. So these kind of problems have been happening through the whole United States for many years. And this is what, the, the, this is what gave birth to the concept of redistricting commissions. Next. This is not a new invention. There are at least a lot of, there are already a lot of states with the redistricting commissions. There are all kinds of flavors and versions and some of them are working better than others. Next, please. But the, the good news is that now we have one in Michigan that passed in the last election and created an amendment in the, in the Michigan constitution. And the name, the official name is the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. They have a website now, it's there. Next, please. Um, and the, my time is almost out. So I want to make two very important points. One is the big thing is that they're going to be in Detroit. They're going to be in June 10, June 15, and June 17. They're going to have public hearings to listen from you and from me. And we at DHDC are working in getting a, a, another event in our facility uh, to be more focused on our issues. And there is more to say about this. These three events in Detroit in June 10th, 15th, and 17th, they are what they call public hearings. And because they are public hearings, they have some rules and they follow the rubber rules and all those things. And the one in the HDC would be a town hall. And because it's a town hall, there are no rules and it's just a back and forward conversation. So they're gonna be here and they're gonna be listening to us. Now the thing is, next please. We need to be ready. If they're going to come and they're going to be listening to us, we need to know what we're going to talk about. And my goal in this presentation is to make you think about it. We at DHDC will have trainings for people to, so you know what you have to talk about and how to say it and what are the areas. And the final goal that people should have is to be able to submit a map on how your district looks like or how you think that your district should look like. And of course you can come and you can say things that you can, if you have a preacher, maybe the preacher can come. Someone can come really pissed off and say bad things, but you can also submit. The map so you can submit it. So, we want you to be at the at the events, and we want you to be trained and educated in what the registry thing is about, and what a, what a, what a map looks like, and how to create one. And we are ready to help you. And my goal in here is to to make you inspired enough so you come to us. And
you were phenomenal. I think you, we have about three minutes left for some questions. That was great. Okay. Uh, and great. thank you okay. so much for, for the slides in particular. Okay. Thank uh, you. Very I know welcome. I'm going to kick it to uh, Christine because it's some questions, but if there's one thing, if you would. Um, so right now you said in the last slide, and it's so good that the, the uh, organization is going to provide technical assistance. Are there some dates that people can reach out to you now to begin to get ready for when um, it will be at the Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation? Right now, right now. Oh, if, you, if, you, if you reach out to me, we can work in one-on-one -on -one or we can invite you to events. We, have, we, we don't have dates yet because we don't know when we will be open and we wanna have live events. And we are planning to be open soon, very, very soon. Uh, so once, or maybe it just falls apart and we never open. So <laughs> that's why we don't have dates today, okay. but we are working on it. So if you give me your name and your contact information, I will make sure that I follow up with you. Great. Christine, thank you. <laughs> Oscar, I love that. And maybe it'll all just fall apart and we'll not be open. Because, <laughs> you know, that is how we've all been living for the last year. Um, hope for the best plan for anything. Um, so I have a question for you. Thank you for the information. It was really, it was really good. I was really excited for this presentation um, myself just to, to learn more. So thank you. Um, since we recently found out that Michigan is losing a congressional rep, how will this affect redistricting? Um, you know, we don't know yet because, see, the, it was big in the news. It was big in the news because it, was, it has a lot of splash effect. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh, we're losing one seat. Oh, my gosh, what is wrong with this? To be practical and objective, it's not a big deal. Number one, because the Democratic majority is is a majority right now in the House, so it will, it's going to have a small effect. So there are how many? There are there are hundreds of representatives. It's going to be a small sliver. This is one piece. The other piece is they haven't. This is not the complete information. It's just a, it's just the first round of information. It doesn't mean that the Michigan is smaller now than 10 years ago. It just means that the proportion of people in Michigan is, just, like, I'm gonna give you one example. Michigan probably has more people now than 10 years ago. The problem is that Colorado grew much more. And the problem is that Texas grew up a lot more. So they have to come, to come up with the detailed numbers to know exactly how many people is. Today, each district for the U.S. Congress in Michigan has 705,000 people. We don't know how many people is going to be in each district in, the, in this coming round until they give us the final numbers. So it's difficult to answer at this point. Does it make sense? It makes sense that it's, you know, this is that we know this small piece of information and that more information needs to come out. I mean, I think there, uh, you know, I, I guess one of my concerns in Jametta, if you want to um, uh, say something as well, but um, I think one of my concerns is that it will happen, you know, it will happen, uh, we'll lose one of the seats in, in, in our area, um, which would mean that we would lose you know, we would we would lose representation of our African American and Latino populations. I think that's that's one of the concerns that I would have. But I don't I don't know. You know, I, I think based on what you're saying, it's it's too early to tell. And so I don't know, Jametta, if you have a yeah. question or a, a thought about that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Christine. And and I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to say this. And then if you don't mind, Oscar, we'll move forward. Um, I think we always do need to be uh, mindful of representation. Uh, there is a disproportionate, uh, there's only one African-American that's from Michigan representing the state. Two, as uh, I think Christine said, we only have two people of color. And the majority that the Democrats have uh, really is slim. It's not overwhelming. Uh, but to our point, uh, what we do with this program is we use knowledge for power. 
And I think that we now know that uh, Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation is working on helping people put your, your comments and your advocacy together. We know that groups look like the NAACP and others, many others are working on this issue. So families, we wanna encourage you, find the organizations that are working on redistricting. It is not a fair price, it's not a fair process. We have, uh, and we're feeling the results of that. So let's get busy. We've got time, we've got some events coming up. Oscar, thank you so much. Um, You're and very we're gonna, welcome. Thank, thank you, you for coming Thank in. you. And we're gonna transition to our next speaker. And just as we talk about opportunities, the other real opportunity we have is that uh, as a result of the election that we've had, we've had some new decisions made about how the millions and billions of dollars in this nation are spent. Uh, so we know that there's been new resources coming into the city and the state. And with the American Rescue Plan, there's probably more opportunities. And to help us better understand what that means in terms of housing, food, uh, access to allow our basic needs, we're always happy to have back with us uh, Wayne Metro. Uh, which is the Community Action Agency for Detroit and Wayne County. And joining us is Jasmine, Jasmine Carson, who is the Integration Assistant Director. Jasmine, welcome uh, and welcome you and Wayne Metro back to the program. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to kind of share some resources and some of the programs we have available here at Wayne Metro. Okay, great. You've got it. Go ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. the next slide. So I first want to um, let everyone know that our Connect Center is open um, six days a week. Um, so we're open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we're also open on Saturdays um, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, next slide. Um, so at our Connect Center, this is uh, primarily our first line of contact for our clients. And um, we take an average of 800 calls per day. Um, so clients are able to be assisted with application completion, conduct pre-screening and provide information and schedule any appointments um, that the clients may need. Um, and we also provide wraparound services at that time. Next slide. Um, so now I'm gonna introduce um, to you some of the programs that we have available um, currently. Next slide, please. The first program that I wanna talk about is the Michigan Energy Assistance Program. Um, it's better known as MEET. So we provide um, energy assistance throughout Wayne County um, through case management and direct assistance. Um, primarily, all of our, our appointments are through our online application or through telephonic appointments. Um, we are not doing in-person um, appointments right now because we are virtual. Um, but um, soon, um, once we get adjusted and once the pandemic is over, we'll probably be back in the office and be able to serve people face-to-face. -face. Um, so clients can receive a to $4,000 toward their utility bill. Um, they must apply for SCR or State of Emergency Relief through MDHHS. Um, they can receive direct assistance. They can be enrolled in affordable payment plans and receive case management services, financial counseling. For MEEP assistance, we do have some additional discretionary funds available. Um, the next program is the Water Residential Assistance Program, or the RAP program. Um, so clients are eligible, eligible to receive um, up to $1,000 um, in direct assistance annually. Um, their past due or arrears are fro frozen, and they can re-enroll in, into this program um, for two years. Um, they receive a 25-monthly credit, which, add, uh, which adds up to $300 um, annually, and can receive up to $700 in arrears um, paid for um, we do have something called Repfinity, um, and this is offered to um, enrollees who are successful for two years. Um, they have someone 62 or older in their household or someone disabled, um, which means that they can be enrolled in RAP as long as the program exists um, if they meet the qualifications. We offer renters and homeowners um, water conservation programs and services. So that's a home water audit or plumbing repair value up to $1,500. And then we also have voluntary water, energy, and financial education workshops. Next slide, please. 
we have food distributions every Friday. Um, we distribute food, cleaning supplies, and personal protection equipment. Um, it's drive up, so it's no contact. Uh, we have four locations, one in Highland Park, one in Taylor, um, one in Dearborn, and also in Detroit. Um, so if you're interested in any food distributions, you can visit any one of those sites, and it's a rotation um, every Friday. Next slide, please. Then one of our newer programs is the SARA program. So that's the COVID Emergency Rental Assistance. Um, this was passed back in December of 2020 uh, with the relief package. Um, we can help renters with past due rent and utility balances. Um, and we can assist people in subsidized housing. And even if you received um, some funding from our eviction diversion program, you still may qualify um, for SARA. In most cases, Payments are made directly to landlords or the utility provider. However, tenants or landlords can apply on behalf of a household. Next slide, please. So who's eligible? So anyone um, with income less than the 80% AMI, which is the area of median income. So for a family of four, um, a AMI, 80% AMI will be about $62,800. Um, so these families have to show type, some type of COVID hardship that can be an unemployment income, loss of income during COVID, um, increased um, expenses during COVID, and past due utility rent notice or economic hardship. Next slide, please. So households up to 50% AMI can receive up to 12 months of assistance and three months for rent. Um, households who are between 50 and 80% AMI can receive up to 10 months of assistance with three months for rent. Uh, we can cover up to $400 in late fees and $150 in um, court costs. So for utilities, we can pay electricity, home heating, water, sewage, and trash. Next slide, please. So if, any, if you're interested in any of um, our rental assistance programs for Detroit, Hamtramck, Tramick, and Highland Park, we have a hotline that you can call. And then for any other areas within Wayne County, um, you'll call that number as well. Um, if you visit waynemetro.org forward slash Sarah, the application is on the website. Next slide. Thank you so much, Jasmine. We appreciate all that information that you just shared and um, definitely, uh, that's very useful to all of our viewers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. All right, moving forward, um, I'd now like to invite our um, resident medical experts to please join us. Um, we have uh, Dr. Angela Cruz, infectious disease fellow from DMC. We have Dr. Nirmal Nandakmar, the medical director of Ascension's My Health uh, Urgent Care and ER doctor. And um, welcoming back Dr. Dennis Cunningham, the System Medical Director of Infection Prevention from Henry Ford. If I could ask the three of you to please highlight your screens, turn on your mics, let's get ready to answer some questions. All right, I see all three of you, wonderful. And I'm gonna just uh, say a quick reminder that uh, you may not have heard in the very beginning, we are translating this in both Spanish and ASL. So we appreciate you speaking slowly and clearly so that our translators can get everything that you say. So welcome back. I'm going to dive right into the questions here. Um, first question is about the vaccine. Um, as we have learned, um, the vaccine has, um, you know, we've, we've seen a sort of slowdown in how it's being administered. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the vaccines um, currently cover the variant? Maybe Dr. Cruz, uh, Dr. Cruz, you want to start with that one? Sure. So the preliminary evidence so far does show that uh, the currently the circulating variant is what we know as the UK variant or the B117, and the current FDA approved vaccines that we have now are showing efficacy against uh, th that particular variant. So, um, yeah, so far that's what we know. Wonderful. So you're seeing that the vaccine that vaccines that we're using are having efficacy or being being um, successful in, against the uh, variant. So far, the, the, the variant that's currently predominant in our, in our uh, environment right now. Now, there are other variants of concern that we know about, and certain studies have shown that they're less effective, but still they are effective still, even at a lesser capacity. 
Okay. So against the main variant that we're seeing, it is fairly effective. Mm -hmm. There are other less pervasive variants at this time that we have seen that they're not, it's not as effective, but for the moment, but it is still effective. Correct. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Donna Kumar, tell us what is happening in the in the uh, emergency department. What are you seeing? Who's coming in? What are the symptoms? Yeah, so for the past few weeks, we've seen a, a surge in patients coming in. Uh, we're seeing the, a younger population than we were seeing before, like last year, last spring. So now we're seeing 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, and 50-year-olds coming in with COVID-type symptoms. The main uh, symptoms are shortness of breath, cough, generalized body aches and pain. Um, the thing that's different now, most of them are not being hospitalized or they're not going to the ICU. So definitely the, uh, the death rate, mortality rate has come down significantly, uh, but the positivity rate has gone up. Uh, the past week or so, we've seen a decline, which is good. Um, but uh, the past month, it's been, uh, we did have a surge in Michigan. Okay. All right. So shortness of breath is one of the main symptoms. And while they're coming into the ED, they're not getting admitted to the ICU as frequently. Correct, correct. Okay, that's great, that's great to hear. Um, Dr. Cunningham, of course, we like to direct all of our questions about kids to you, given that you're a pediatrician. Um, talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, what precautions should parents be taking as they look to, to take their kids on play dates, go to the parks, um, you know, start to be engaged with sports? What are some of the things that parents should be doing or, or caregivers, adult caregivers or kids should be doing to keep our kids safe? The first thing I would do is I'd encourage vaccination for kids 16 and over. The Pfizer COVID vaccine is approved down to that age. I do expect within the next month or so that we're going to see the Pfizer vaccine approved for even younger ages down to 12. Uh, Pfizer did already submit their data to the FDA for that group, and it looked quite promising, quite well tolerated. The main thing for kids, I do think playing outside is safer than playing inside. Again, hand washing, if your kids are sick, please don't send them out. If they're gonna be really close together, especially indoors, masks are still advised if kids will tolerate it. Uh, kids under two rarely will wear a mask. It's not a good idea because they could choke on it. Under five years of age, I find it hard for kids to wear their masks for any prolonged periods of time. But above that age, that's probably our most effective uh, tool we have. Okay, great. And Dr. Cunningham, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a follow up to something you just said about the masks um, being, you know, for the, the we have a mandate for uh, children under the age of two, or two and up to wear masks. Talk to us a little bit about why that might have been mandated. What what's the, some of the rationale behind it? I think the reason it was mandated because we do know masks help to decrease transmission. Young kids are not able to get a vaccine at this time against COVID. And I think that was the intent behind the mandate. However, I think as a pediatrician, I'm not convinced it's gonna be very practical to implement. Mm -hmm. There was some conversation that I'd heard with people saying, well, you know, if you think about who's getting the who's sort of, we're seeing getting COVID as Dr. Nandakumar said, as a parent, you know, people in their thirties and forties, they may have kids who are of that age. So potentially it's to sort of help that back and forth. Is there any validity to that? Absolutely. But even though kids don't get COVID, their symptoms tend to be a lot more mild. There are still a significant number of kids who wind up in the hospital from COVID. Some of them can have very serious complications, especially there's this missile, this inflammatory syndrome, which can follow COVID infection by a few weeks. It's a generalized uh, inflammation in the body. Those kids can be pretty sick. So we do want to stop it as much as possible. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cruz, since your specialty is infectious disease, could you tell us a little bit about the virus itself? Um, how long does it live on surfaces? And, and, and uh, you know, we've heard about wearing masks and washing our hands. What else do we need to do as a part of our regular life to keep us from, you know, getting affected? So in terms of your first question about how long the virus lives on surfaces, so it varies from surface to surface. They did various studies, whether on paper, on wood, on steel. So it ranges from a few hours to several days. But the key thing is, um, the transmissibility from fomites or from surfaces they've found are like is likely to be low. 
the main mode of transmission still is through respiratory droplets. So from person to person in closed spaces. So again, um, thinking about that, the important thing is to try to uh, stick to the public health measures that we've always been um, reminding people, which is social distancing and washing of hands. So even if it's in the surfaces, if you are mindful about hand hygiene, then that's certainly a means of preventing spread through that um, method. Okay, so that's very important. You're saying that it can live on surfaces and for certain surfaces up to a few days, but the likelihood of spreading it is still higher in terms of just breathing it in. Yes, and, and hand hygiene. Yeah, because if you have like, if your hand is in contact with the surface with the COVID virus, you would have to put your hand on your face. And that would be like the, the mode by which the, the virus is, uh, that you get infected with the virus. But that's low as compared to the respiratory droplet transmission. Okay. So what you're telling me is that the fact that I wash my hands every four to five minutes, <laughs> probably keeping me safe. Might be drying out my hands a bit, but it's keeping me safe. <laughs> Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Nanda Kumar, as we think about um, the vaccines, and we've sort of heard that they have a six month, we're thinking six months of, um, you know, effectiveness. What do you think is going to happen about six months after we've had, you know, most of our people vaccinated, which coincidentally is going to be right before school starts? Do we expect another surge? You know, what are, what are you preparing for in the ED? Well, I think it'll be similar to what happened last year. Last summer, we had a plateau, things leveled off, but then we had a surge in the fall. And now, um, as Dr. Kuzi mentioned, there's other variants out there, and uh, specifically the South African variant. If that comes here and becomes a problem, we're definitely going to have another surge. Uh, the summertime, people are going to be out and about. There's going to be more traveling. Kids will be in camp. So uh, we're definitely uh, expecting a surge to happen in the fall. And uh, everything that I've read and uh, looked into probably all going to need a, a booster vaccine uh, this fall. Definitely the high risk patients, so you know, 50 and 60 year olds and over with the other health issues will definitely need a booster and same with uh, all the first responders, physicians and whatnot will need, uh, will most likely need a booster also. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Cunningham, is that how Henry Ford's also preparing for sort of something similar? Well, I, I will say we know the vaccine gives good protection for at least six months. The manufacturers have an ongoing study to measure antibodies and volunteers. They're looking at the nine month data right now. So I think we're gonna certainly have a longer than six months protection. I agree with the booster doses. It's probably gonna be booster doses like influenza where every year it's tweaked a little bit to get whatever strains are currently circulating. If we can get to about 50% of our population vaccinated, we can really halt COVID. Israel had great success doing that when they got to 50% of people having two doses, the number of cases dropped dramatically as they got even higher. COVID essentially is almost gone right now from that country. So we can get there, but people need to still wear the mask, the social distancing until everyone has the vaccine or until we have a lot more people with the vaccine. My concern is we have plenty of vaccine, far more than people who want to get vaccinated. And that's, um, that just means we're going to be dealing with COVID and these little outbreaks more and more. And I, you know, if we can talk a little bit more about that, and, and I welcome any of you to sort of answer this, then I know we've got questions from the audience as well. But, you know, we have a significant, we have a section of the population who is, is not comfortable getting vaccinated, is not choosing to get vaccinated right now for a variety of reasons. Can we talk a little bit about why that's important and how that, as you just said, Dr. Kram, we're gonna keep dealing with COVID. Can you explain a little bit about why? Why is that the case? Well, if enough people have been vaccinated or infected, they're protected against another infection. They'll have some protection. Now, strain, different strains can make this a whole nother ball game, but as long as there's people who are susceptible as the infection spreads, more and more people get sick, they give it to other people. If we can get people vaccinated, that's our best bet to get this virus under control and stop transmission in our community. Without more people getting vaccinated, I think we're gonna have these COVID surges where every six to 12 weeks, we're gonna have another spike in the number of hospital admissions. Uh, just gonna keep going on and on. And 
that's really what concerns me the most. Our healthcare workers are tired. Uh, the amount of stress and work that they've been doing is incredible and they really need a break. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anything so, to add? Yeah. Yeah. In addition to what Dr. Cunningham said, um, it's important to remember that vaccination as a measure is not just like an individual management thing. It's a community-based measure. So unlike like when you take course of antibiotics, you're treating a patient. With vaccination, you're treating a community. So it's a hand-in-hand -hand effort when you when you get yourself vaccinated, you're not only protecting yourself, you're protecting the weaker members of society in terms of their immune system. So I think that that's an important message um, to, say, to send to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and then lastly, just from each of your perspectives, um, how are people getting COVID? You know, you, you're each seeing patients that have it. Uh, you know, Dr. Nandakumar, maybe you can start and we can move on to that, but how are they getting it? Well, you know, we, when we've seen surges in the ER, it's usually been after either there's been a holiday vacation or some, some big event. So after Christmas, New Year's holiday, about a week or two later, we saw a surge. Uh, after spring break, there are a lot of families and people traveling. So again, about a week after that, <clears throat> we saw another surge. And also around that time, there was a couple sporting events where people were getting together. So at least in the ER, you know, a lot of it was either people who were traveling, you know, people who were refusing to get the vaccine. That's where we saw a lot of spread in the community and uh, a lot more visits to the hospital and admission. Mm -hmm. Great. Dr. Cunningham, do you concur with that? Is that what you're seeing also? I do. What I don't think has gotten enough attention is when schools, sports resumed, there were hundreds of outbreaks associated with sporting events. Each outbreak in turn had hundreds of cases associated with it. And I think that and the spring break travel were probably the biggest factors for this last surge. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cruz, same thing. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, it's just, a, just in addition to that. So the virus needs people to, to spread. So as long as like people are traveling, areas where there are there's people in small places um, that are unvaccinated in, at this point in time, then you, you can expect outbreaks here and there still. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Christine, I know we've got questions from the audience. Let me, uh, let me turn it over to you. And then I know... Um, I think we're going to bring Jasmine back after these guys for a couple of questions as well. So go ahead. I'll let you ask a question. Yeah. yeah so Jasmine, you're on deck. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so the, the first question is, what is your opinion about people who said the vaccine affected their health? So I guess the ahead, question Dr. I have is, in particular, what were the issues with the health? We know that people can have some short-term side effects, you know, body aches, headache, muscle aches, fatigue, but I really haven't seen a whole lot of impact on people's health. Now with the Johnson & Johnson, Janssen COVID vaccine, that's the one that was associated with the rare blood clot in the brain. There were 15 cases and about 3.99 million women vaccinated. So very, very small risk. And just to put it in perspective, you have a much greater chance of getting in a car accident, going to the grocery store or dying in that car accident than those very, very rare blood clots out there. So all in all, I have not really seen a big impact on individuals after getting the vaccine. And I don't mean to trivialize the 15 women who got the rare blood clot, but when you look how many hundreds of thousands of people alone in this country have died. To me, the benefits of the vaccine far outweigh the risks. Dr. Cruz, did you want to add anything since I know this is, this is an area of expertise for you? I believe Dr. Cunningham addressed the question pretty well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so the next question is, do the current vaccines protect against the South African variant? Who would like to take that? Yes, everything that I've read, uh, it does protect, 
does protect against the South African variant. It's not as uh, efficacious as it is against the uh, UK variant, but still there is uh, protection against uh, the South African variant. I would add that when we it's say not- it's a little bit less effective, people may get COVID, but it tends to be a much more mild disease where they don't need to go to the doctor or the emergency room or get admitted to the hospital. Great. And then Dr. Cruz, did you want to add something to that? Yeah. So like what they said, it's still effective, but just not to the same degree. The important thing is it's still effective. So we still rec- would recommend vaccination. So they, they can, they can um, be confident that they are, they are still, it would still confer protection against the South African variant. And while we talk so, about the South I, African okay. variant, again, the UK variant's the most predominant. There's mm-hmm. some of the South African strain. There's also the California or West Coast strains. The vaccines do work against it, maybe not quite as well. There was one case north of Lansing of the Indian or India variant. Uh, There's good data from Israel that the vaccines work against that as well. And then there's been a few cases of the Brazil P1 strain in the state. That's the wild card. I'm not sure how well the vaccines are going to work against it, but I do expect they're going to have some activity. And that takes care of all the variants that have been identified in Michigan as of this week. Okay, I have two, uh, well, three questions, and I know we're short on time, so I'm going to ask for a little bit more time. Um, so the um, so Governor, Governor Whitmer today tied report uh, reopening plans to vaccination rates. Does this seem like the, ra- the right plan moving forward? So for example, if we have 65%, I think, I think it's a 65% vaccination rate then there's a number of restrictions that will get lifted. Does this seem like the right plan to you all? Scientifically, I think it makes sense. Is it practical? I don't know. Okay. Anyone else want to add to that? I'm I'm not sure if you've read it, so it's okay if you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to say anything. Go ahead, Dr. Cruz. Yeah, I think it, it's sort of like a wait and see kind of thing. Like as we slowly relax the restrictions, we have to watch about, about we ought to have to watch about the numbers. How are they doing? Because we were sort of, I guess, taken aback with this recent surge about two, three, four weeks ago. And, you know, sometimes you have to pause and try to see what caused it. What are the factors? What kind of patients are getting sick this time around? What are we doing wrong? And so every time you relax, uh, I think it's it's based on sound um, evidence. But um, more than anything, I think it's a wait and see approach. Great. So evidence is important. We need to make sure that we're looking at the evidence and that we're we're weighing the evidence against the against uh, you know the action steps in terms of reopening. Um, you spoke to this, all of you, I've heard you speak to this ab- about the vaccine, that um, that there are some folks that have gotten COVID even after they've been vaccinated. And um, because that has, you know, obviously been made public and, and it's been out there uh, in, in the public, um, you know, some people have been discouraged to get vaccinated. So could you talk a little bit about um, folks that end up getting COVID even though they've been vaccinated and, and should you still get vaccinated even though you could still get COVID? I actually track the numbers of COVID patients in Henry Ford employees after vaccination. I can tell you we've had 58 employees who had COVID after both doses of the vaccine. That's roughly a 0.28% of vaccinated people. Uh, They're all very mild illnesses doing great. When I compare it to the employees who chose not to get the vaccine, if you didn't get the vaccine, their chances of getting COVID are 25 times higher than the vaccinated group. And those are the employees who are sicker, wind up in the emergency department or the hospital. Uh, CDC just came out this week and they said for the adults over 65, I believe that 
if you're vaccinated, um, decreased hospitalization rate by 94%, which is an incredible number. So no vaccines 100%, but you're never gonna get something that's gonna give 100%. This vaccine is far more effective than some vaccines we use like flu. To me, it's a no brainer that you should get this vaccine. I received it, my family has received it, and I'm just a big believer in it. Does anyone wanna add anything to that? Go ahead, Dr. Cruz. Yes, we have similar a similar experience uh, at the Detroit Medical Center of our employees who we did have some what they call vaccine breakthroughs who even if they've been fully vaccinated, important to note that fully vaccinated means two weeks out of your second dose of the mRNA vaccines and two weeks after the J&J uh, vaccine. So even then, like what uh, Dr. Cunningham said for their experience, we have a similar experience where these patients, although some of them were symptomatic, they were mild and they all did fairly well despite having gotten COVID after the vaccination. So we would still recommend it. Like he said, like looking at the numbers, the protection that it offers alone um, would, uh, the benefit that it offers, I would still, rec we would still highly recommend it. Great. So this is, uh, there's one question that's really related to women. And, and what I want to tell that listener is that we are going to have um, some, some doctors on next week specifically to talk about the vaccine and, um, and issues specifically related to women, maternal health, so on and so forth. Uh, um, so, but the last question I'm going to ask you all, what are the risks of giant surges like what's happening in India? What can the U.S. do to support other countries like India who are experiencing extreme COVID surges? Send them vaccine. They need vaccine. Dr. Cruz, anything to add to that? That would be my my answer too. Uh, I mean, I know that <laughs> okay. for India specifically, they also are lacking in terms of supply. It's gotten so bad that they they're running out of oxygen tanks. So any for, other countries have been offering support, but really the cornerstone I would agree would be vaccinations. It's a race against time between the development of new variants and getting enough numbers of of the pop a certain percentage of the population vaccinated. So. If there's any message that we would leave you with, it's that. <laughs> Thank you all so much. We appreciate your time. It seems unreal that we're, we're in this, um, but I feel so grateful that um, you all share your time and your expertise with us so that we can better understand what is is going on and and how we can uh one protect ourselves but also protect our community and in this last question protect um our our global citizens so thank you all so much jasmine if you could just pop on for just a minute um i wanted to uh follow up a, with a question with you um could you just quickly explain what is rent forward that what does that, that mean? That, yeah, so that means that um, they can receive up to 12 months rent and then three months past that 12 months. So they will calculate it and they can still receive that money towards that rental. So if I was renting an apartment today, mm -hmm. I could apply for 12 months rent mm -hmm. and then another three months into 2022. Am I Correct. understanding that right? Correct. Great. Okay. And then I just also, just because I just talked to Representative Rashida Tlaib this morning separate on a separate issue, but she reminded us all on the call of how important it is for people to apply for these dollars now and not wait until they have an eviction notice or a shutoff notice. And I just wanted to confirm with you, Jasmine, that her urgency around that to us is, is true, that if people are struggling right now, they should reach out to Wayne Metro right now and not wait for the 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 bills in the red letters. <laughs> That's absolutely correct. Apply now. The, the funds are available now. We're working around the clock. If you have any type, any assistance that you need, 
please contact Wayne Metro um, through our Connect Center or visit our website at waynemetro.org. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And I know that the folks on this call and others in the community would love to partner with Wayne Metro and maybe having you all come out um, and, and maybe do some signups in neighborhoods so that we can, we can make sure that, that folks are getting access to these dollars. Um, since we know that there's a time limit of when they need to be spent and, um, and we know that, that we, we want to make sure that we're getting these dollars out to our families that need them, you know, pretty desperately right now. So thank you for all the hard work that you do to make that happen. I know it's no easy feat on in a normal time, but I know it's even harder right now. So thank you for all you do, Jasmine. And I think I'm passing it. I'm, I'm passing it to Jametta. She's off mute. So I'm going to ask Jametta to come back on. And thank you so much, Jasmine. And thank you, Wayne Metro, for what you do for our families. Thank you. And just uh, reinforcing, uh, again, the appreciation for that. A lot of things to try to keep up with. And if we think about the conversation that we just had with our physicians, and uh, it really creates uh, an opportunity for us to hear from one of our leaders um, in the city of Detroit that has been having to juggle these same kinds of issues. Folks are doing that in education. But those of us like Christine, Molly, myself, and others that lead uh, nonprofit uh, organizations, we too are trying to juggle this to keep our families and keep our staff safe. Well, I'm really pleased to welcome back to the program uh, Robert Jamison. Robert is the CEO of PAL. And I think so many of us know about the long legacy of the Police Athletic League and know that it has been one of those institutions in the city of Detroit that has made it a point where our young people, our little people to teenagers, have a place for physical fitness uh, and to get introduced to sports and all of the sportsmanship that should be part of that. Uh, Robert, welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I love this um, platform because we're at our best when we come together. Um, we have parents, we have uh, concerned people, we have the medical field. This coalition is what's needed to make decisions. And um, we're, as Jametta mentioned earlier, um, we're, we've been affected, right? Um, and really, um, what we found is you have to go back to your grassroots uh, mission, and that's being a source in the community, either it's awareness, access, or utilization of resources. And when we're at our best at Detroit PAL, we're addressing uh, social economic needs, education needs, and health and wellness needs um, because we're able to do what we do best and that's attract families because of the fun that comes with play and sports and youth enrichment activities. But we are dedicated and we understand you know, our duties to be able to align them to these other resources uh, with many of the organizations that, you know, may be on the phone now or organizations that are across the, the community. So I'm going to hit on a couple of things that I think are really relevant right now. So um, we are always on the line uh, looking to see what the health department's doing or um, the mayor's address or Governor Whitmer's address to really stay in tune. Um, we decided early on to really side with safety we made a, a very important decision with our football and cheer program, which many people know is our largest sports programming, um, to postpone it, right? And we had a lot of our coaches and organizations even to form their own uh, own league to continue playing. And they did well because we, you know, we wish them the best, but mm -hmm. we just wanted to side on caution um, just because we understand the importance of um, these youth may go out and be fine, but um, we never know who they're going home to. And some of them go home to grandparents mm -hmm. or uh, their environments where they may not have all of the safety precautions in place. And um, we just wanted to make sure that we were doing our part with that. But what sports are we doing? Um, we're doing soccer, but we're shifting it to more of the skills uh, and clinics because we have an opportunity to be able to space them out more and be able to really still develop, create fun environments, um, but to create an atmosphere where there's safety for the players and the coaches and um, parents can still watch. Um, we've also done things with baseball, right? There's some sports um, that are just a little uh, less contact. And mm -hmm. so, um, but we've added some things that, you know, may cause it to be a little more cumbersome 
But if you're looking at, do I wear a mask while playing or do I, after each inning, you know, wipe balls off or do I keep my balls as the ones that I use or um, do I make sure dugouts are clean after every, I mean, so there's some things that we're doing as a safety measure. And sometimes people may think it's over the top, but no one wants to be there when one person is infected and um, things um, become more difficult for them. So those are some of the things that we're doing. We also shifted to really um, part of our mission, and many may not know it, is even though sports is a big, important part of what we do, we shifted to youth enrichment programming as a must to really align them to helping them find their greatness by aligning them to these other aspects of their lives. Um, so our great model is what we use, and I'll share it only because I think it's relevant for you as a parent or you as someone else that's doing programming. Um, the GREAT model stands for this, the G is goal setting. So if they come and become a part of our sports program or youth enrichment programming, number one thing that we ask them to do is to set goals. And it's easy to align to a sport. You ran faster, you jumped higher, you won a game. Um, just writing it down puts them in position to be good, become a great employee, employer, or an entrepreneur uh, that impacts the community in the future. Um, the R is resilience, and we talk a lot about what they're facing right now. This is only making them stronger. It's making them uh, able to face the things that we know they're going to face in uh, the near future. The E is embracing healthy lifestyles, and I think it was mentioned earlier on the call. Physical activity helps to address some of the health disparities, but also the mental aspect, a therapist, and having someone that you can talk to during these difficult times it's okay to be not okay. It's okay to be able to open up to someone and share that you're not okay. And so we've done a lot with some of our psychologist friends and psychiatrist friends to be able to talk to our mentors, families, and even our youth to hear their perspective. The A is accountability. And this is why I challenge the parents that are on the line right now. When you think about coaches, you think about um, teachers, you think about um, police officers, um, they're going to be some that are challenged. But one thing you can control is your effort, attitude, actions, and behavior. And that's the opportunity for you as a parent to have that meaningful dialogue because you can't always quit or move or shift someone because of uh, someone not doing the way, doing things the way you may want them to be done. So A is accountability and T is finally teamwork. And so our relationship with the police department is even more important right now when you think about some of the police relation challenges that sometimes flare up across the nation. Um, fortunately, Detroit hasn't experienced them to the extent as some of the other areas. And I think because of its commitment to preventative um, police and community policing, and a lot of that work is done through Detroit PAL. When you enter our programs, we align your youth with those types of programs. So mm -hmm. I think in answering those questions, I can open it up to see um, if people have any concerns as a parent or if you're trying to say, what types of programs should I enter them in? Um, or how do I get engaged in Detroit PALS programs that we offer? And if we don't offer them, we definitely uh, align you with some organizations that do offer them. But we do chess right now. We just had an article in the Free Press that talked about critical thinking skills. And we added some activity to make it fun mm -hmm. for our youth to play chess. We have Apple who sponsors uh, the computers that they use. And they don't even have to come in contact because they can use the computer screens to do those things. We have science programming, we have um, literacy programming. So we have a lot of things that you can do and engage your youth and then add some activity into it so they have the best of both worlds uh, during this time where we're trying to move a little slower and be a little more prudent uh, to protect our youth and protect our families. So uh, Jametta, I'll open it up for questions for anyone uh, if there are any out there. Yeah, um, and so while I think Christine or others are pulling the questions together, just really seriously wanna congratulate you. Um, because you have erred on the side of caution and knowing that you and your team are absolutely ready to go to be able to provide the kinds of experiences that you've had success with. And it's really hard to, to make this shift. But I think you've also have helped the audience and all of us think about the ways that we can still be creative and purposeful in still meeting our mission, but a different kind of way. And that focus on enrichment uh, is really so 
uh, important. I want to make sure, though, uh, that as people are listening, and Christine, I'm going to pop it to you. Uh, Robert, for just a quick moment, could you share again how people would get in touch with you, both the, the PAL number and if there is anything in particular they should ask for? Yeah, so um, the PAL number is 313-833-1600. That's 313-833-1600. Or you can go to DetroitPAL.org, and that's DetroitPAL.org, and you'll find a list of all the programs that we offer. Um, And I would challenge you, watch some of the videos so you can see that it's fun, it's engaging, and um, really they're getting more than just playing a sport. They're learning about themselves and, and learning valuable uh, leadership skill sets. So thank you, uh, Jametta, for making sure I put that in there. Great. Christine. Hi, Robert. It's really um, interesting to hear how PAL has, a, has moved and adjusted in this time. Um, just one question about looking forward this summer and beyond. Um, what type of sports are are you all going to be offering um, as, as we look for as you look forward? Yeah, so we have our summer camp. Um, so if you go online, you'll be able to see we're going to be launching our summer camp. Um, we have a program called Critical Conversations. This is where you um, get to engage with our police officers, and we're doing it virtually. And we may try to do some in person, but imagine. Um, five youth going in a a breakout room with one officer and we put topics up there like, how do you deal with social media? Um, What are your rights? Um, You know, what does it mean to be able to um, speak uh, your piece, right? And and it creates empathy for both sides, police and for the youth. Um, We also have baseball that's coming up. And so, um, like I mentioned earlier, we'll be doing that. Um, we have some soccer clinics that will be coming up for boys and for young ladies. Mm-hmm. Um, and then our tiny programs. I love the tiny programs. We're already doing golf. It's called Little Putters. Can you imagine that? <laughs> little Putters. Um, we fought over the name. I wanted, We wanted to call it Little Eagles because I went to St. Martin de Porres. Um, but uh, they won out on Little Putters. Uh, but we're doing that. Um, we're doing, uh, uh, when I mentioned golf, I, we're doing uh, the chess and um, we are planning for our football and cheer to come back uh, because we okay, saw I, and we have some best practices uh, that I think will allow for us to do it. But once again, it all it takes all of us to do it. I know uh, Governor Whitmer talked about that 70 percent threshold where we began to release another set of um, restrictions um, to be uh, removed. Right. And so we all have to do our part. Um, we have to be able to talk to our family members to make sure that. Um, they're going to do it. And it's nothing better than a testimony um, as simple as going to Facebook saying, I got my shots. Right. And so um, hopefully that answers that question. It does. And I, I sort of want to know how old the little putters is, because maybe I have some little putters in my family. Um. <laughs> so little, little putters are five to eight. So like for my four year old who's still working on being civilized still, uh, you got a little more time for him because he may hit you with the putter. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. Well, I have two little putters then. So, okay. Um, but Ro- so I was, th- my last question and, and cause you raised it, could, if you have gotten your vaccines, could you provide a really quick testimonial on the spot? Yeah. So what's interesting and Jametta probably knows my, my background. So I worked at Pfizer pharmaceuticals, right. Mm-hmm. And so I actually was working on a, health disparity studies, looking at improving vaccination rates across multicultural groups. And one of the things I was doing during that project is we talked about the importance of a coalition. So I mentioned that earlier, but also the importance of a trusted source. So mm-hmm. Jametta, a trusted source in the communities that she serves, PALS, a trusted source in the community. But a trusted source can only go so far without having a person of expertise. So Dr. Cruz from DMC, who was speaking earlier, if a patient goes in and they don't hear once they're drawn in by this trusted source, uh, the doctor saying, yes, you need to get the vaccine, then that's when some of the other experiences and uh, challenges and misconceptions people may have or fears that people may have uh, cause them not to get it done. So for me, I was confident that when I think about pharmaceutical companies and even working in that field, uh, Pfizer uh, would definitely not want to put anyone at risk Uh, for the dollars that they can make in the short term over a vaccine. So they're going to do everything they can to keep their reputation and to be able to make sure they're providing 
a product that is safe um, and a product that people um, will be able to potentially save lives uh, versus putting something out there that would be risky. One of the things that people um, sometimes can, uh, can be uh, fearful of is how fast it came out. And sometimes the quick of it, the quickness of it coming out is a lot to do with sometimes there's order and the number of, you know, products that are available and that are going under um, discussion. So there's a phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four type of trials. And so there are some things that were sped up, but safety is something that they cannot um, take a risk on. They cannot speed up the types of um, significant uh, improvement in opportunities for efficacy first and then safety uh, as a measure for it. So yeah, I've got my second vaccine uh, a couple of days ago, a little sore. I'm feeling good. Um, I speak things into existence, so I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to be fine. And uh, uh, I encourage everyone else to get their vaccine. Thank you so much for your testimonial. And Jametta, I'm going to kick it back to you. Thank you for all that you're doing for young people right now and the adjustments that you've made um, during this time so that families can still be connected and young people can still be connected. Jametta? Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you in particular for raising uh, your own experience uh, with Pfizer, because one of the issues, just to kind of do a, a quick personal privilege, and we as advocates are saying this, um, we know that there is justifiable lived experience of in institutional racism. And we know the experience that not only in the past that African-Americans and other people of color had, but even present. But the reality is, is just what you said, Robert, is that uh, Black folk as scientists, as administrators, uh, have been involved in the development of these vaccines. And uh, unfortunately, there's not enough that are in the public view to see and to be giving the testimonies that you're giving. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really important. And let's talk about that um, some more. Uh, we really got to do it because we got to stop COVID uh, so we can move forward with our lives. Uh, and we can't do it unless we have this whole community working together, being knowledgeable. And yes, I got my backs. Um, so with that, uh, Robert, let's be in touch on this. And, and by the way, cool. come hang out with us tomorrow at the DPN from 12 to 6. We're going to be doing COVID testing and stomping it down uh, with vaccines for uh, children and adults from 16 and up. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. This is a great platform and very informative. Thank you. Good, good. Love it. Little putters. Don't you just love that? I love that. Okay. Um, so speaking of things that we love, we love our Detroit Health Department because they stand up for us and have done it uh, continuously. And really pleased to have Hannah Ewing to return uh, to keep us informed of not only our overall health, because it's about being healthy all the time, that enables us to be healthier when pandemics like a COVID hit us, and it has hit us. Uh, Hannah, please come on, and if you would, give us some updates about uh, the vaccine itself, and I love how you have that first slide. Detroit, Detroit growing stronger, growing stronger together. Hannah, welcome. Thank you so much. And I love the little putters. I've been smiling about it. Behind I know. <laughs> um, great. So this is the current situation. Um, I'm going to be brief on the updates just with short of time, but our numbers are going down. We are about 20% last week and now we're at 15.2. This is just showing our communities taking care of one another, getting vaccinated and following those good COVID guidelines. Next slide, please. And this is the graph of the positivity rate showing that Detroit is continuing to go down. And next slide, please. And our vaccine rate is almost at 30%. We're still lagging behind the other counties, but I'm gonna go ahead and talk about all the wonderful ways this week that the city has increased access to the vaccine. Next slide, please. And we'll go through a couple more. Just keep clicking forward for me. Next one, next one, and perfect. Yeah, we can go there. So let's talk about a couple of new exciting things about what you can do once you're vaccinated. So the first is that you can visit a home or a private setting without a mask um, with fully vaccinated people. This is super exciting for me because I'm gonna see my grandma for the first time in a year and we're gonna be able to do so safely. You can also visit inside a home or private setting without a mask with one other unvaccinated household 
who are at low risk from severe COVID illness. So this is a household where there's young people or people without pre-existing conditions. So no people with asthma or hypertension, just so we make sure that everyone stays safe and healthy. You can also travel domestically without pre or post testing, travel domestically without quarantining. You do not have to quarantine if you were exposed to someone who had COVID. So say you were at the workplace, you would not need to get um, to quarantine if you are exposed. The only thing to look out for is to monitor for symptoms. And if you start showing symptoms of COVID-19, like a cough, chills, fever, and things like that, then you're gonna isolate. And the last new thing this week is that we can gather or conduct activities outdoors without wearing a mask, except in certain crowded settings and venues. So that's new. Next slide, please. And remember, this guidance is only for fully vaccinated people. For the Pfizer and Moderna, it's a two-dose series, and you have to wait 14 days after your second dose to be fully protected. And the next one is a two weeks after your single dose, which is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Next slide, please. So we're excited to announce our Let's Get Back Family Vaccine Day this Saturday, May 1st, 2021, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., there's going to be food trucks, free parkings, and giveaways, and this event is specifically geared towards families. And to register, just give us a call at 313-230-0505. This is one of the ways we're trying to increase access to our Detroiters. Next slide, please. So for additional appointments, you're going to call that same number, 313-230-0505, Monday through Friday and you're gonna press the button one for a vaccine option. They'll ask you a couple pieces of information like your name, address, date of birth, phone number, email, and if you've ever had a previous allergic reaction so they know what to look out for when you're getting your vaccine. Next slide, please. We also have a very exciting new program called the When We're Bringing Back the Good Neighbor Initiative. You can get paid to get your neighbors vaccinated Every person you bring in the car with you, I think up to three people, you will get $50 per person per shot. So you can get $50 the first shot. And then next time you bring them for their next dose, you can get $50 again. In order to be uh, eligible for this program, you need to register and you can register by calling us at 313-230-0505 and just let them know that you wanna participate in the Good Neighbor program. Next slide, please. And some additional ongoing locations. We, as always, have the TCF Center available with drive through and walk-in appointments. If you'd like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you can visit the Northwest Activity Center at 18100 Myers or the Straight Gate International Church, which is a new drive through location. Both are offering the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Additionally, we have uh, appointments available at the Robert Thoreau Comente Recreational Center and the Farewell Recreational Center every Monday through Friday from nine to one. And if you are a person who works during the day, we have additional evening locations. The first is at Clark Park at 1130 Clark Street from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. And the next one is at the Samaritan Center. Next slide, please. And additionally, we are continuing on with our community Saturdays. Every Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., you can get your vaccines at Second Ebenezer Church, Fellowship Chapel, or Greater Grace Temple. Next slide, please. And if you're a person who loves maps, we've also created this great graphic so you can see what looks like close to where you live and work, and you can get vaccinated. And next slide, please. And if you don't know that, or you don't like using maps, you can always use our text line to text your address to find the three nearest locations to you using the number 313-217-3732 to find out what the vaccine locations are closest to you. Next slide, please. And as always, we encourage you to continue following the public health guidelines, get your COVID-19 vaccines if you are eligible, practice good hand hygiene, continue to social and physically distance six feet apart and wear your face mask when you are around uh, people in crowded spaces and interacting with people outside of your home. Next slide, please. 
And you can always give us a call at 313-876-4000. We have a line now manned by registered nurses where you can call and ask them any question you have about getting vaccinated or COVID-19 in general. And email us at dhdoutbreak at detroitmi.gov. And that's everything. Um, that was phenomenal as always. And it's been uh, really wonderful to be able to see how our city has created an infrastructure uh, of resources and places for our community to go. And we see that between the city, between hospitals, nonprofits, mobile clinics, church base. Um, it's going to take all of us, isn't it, Christine? Uh, we've been at this now for yes. 14 months. And if we don't get focused and realize that taking a shot is really no different than how we stop down measles, smallpox, polio, uh, is so needed. So handed it to you to, to end us out from another really powerful uh, Thursday with the COVID Coalition. Great. Thank you so much, Janetta. Thank you, Hannah. We do have one suggestion. Could you guys... So people would really like the health department to offer more of the clinics at uh, the at schools. So just take that back to your team, and um, uh, we'd like to see more of that. We're hearing from the audience. So Absolutely. so thank you so much, Hannah, for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, so the first thing that we before we close out that that we would love you to do is if you have literally one minute help us honor teachers this month who have made an impact in your life. Um, you can complete a five minute survey to nominate an educator who's inspired you or your child. And again, it doesn't have, you don't have to be a student right now. This could be somebody that inspired you to get where you are today, or you can be a student right now, but we really want to honor teachers um, this month during teacher appreciation month. Um, 482 Forward has launched a community voting tool for each school district in the state to vote on how they want the school stimulus money to be spent. Uh, we've got another survey for you. It's really a voting tool. Please, it's getting dropped in the chat. Fill it out. Um, we really, we have this opportunity right now to make some decisions about um, how how the money that's coming down in the stimulus packages are spent. Um, please let your voice be heard around that. Uh, next, DHDC has launched a language justice petition and they are asking folks to sign it. And really what this petition is, is to ensure that schools are providing, um, providing information um, in the language, the native language of their students and their students' uh, caregivers. It's really important um, as parents that we're able and caregivers that we're able to support our children. And if, you know, if, our, if we speak a language other than English, um, it's really important that we get that information in our native language. So that uh, um, link is also being dropped in the chat. Um, you just heard about the City of Detroit Family Vaccine Day. Um, this is a great event uh, at the Pistons Training Facility. Again, that's this Saturday, this Saturday, 9 to 5. Uh, there will be food and Pistons giveaways. And apparently there's also going to be some Girl Scout cookies. It, that's, oh. that's the word on the street. So, uh, you know. Go check that out if you have not gotten vaccinated. And lastly, DPN Week of the Young Child celebrating powerful parenting with advocacy and health workshops and a family day with vaccine and testing. So if you can't make it on Saturday, DPN has, um, is offering vaccine and testing this Friday. There's virtual options and outdoor options. Go see Jametta and her team. Um, they would love to have you. Uh, so that's it for today. Um, the, oh, I'm sorry. There's two more vaccine clinics that are coming up. One at our organization at Urban Neighborhood yeah. Initiative and DHDC. And we will uh, give more details as those days come. And Jametta, it looks like you have something. So go ahead. Oh, no, I just came on because oh, I'm okay. ready for us to wrap up. <laughs> All right. 
So if everybody can turn their cameras on and go see Jametta, we want to remind everybody to stay healthy, stay powerful, and uh, stay informed. We'll see you all later. Stay strong, stay blessed, stay masked up, get your back.